Excellent. Okay. So, I'm not saying that God is not the source of authority of the Bible. I very carefully have made no such statement. I'm saying that modern Bible scholars, when they uh, treat the Bible, right, the fact of God's authorship, if that's the right word, is simply is a historical fact in the sense that ancient Jews, Christians, Israelites believed. That is an important historical fact. The truth of that historical fact is a question that most modern Bible scholars won't touch on the grounds that it's not susceptible to historical analysis. How is one going to prove that God really wrote, composed, inspired, pick a verb, the Bible? How, you, how would you prove that? How would you disprove that? Ah, oh, good point. Right. So therefore, most modern Bible scholars don't touch that. But what is a clear historical fact is the role of the book played in the, in the community, in the development of culture, religion, civilization. That's clear. That's something which we can discuss. Is that a satisfactory answer? That is absolutely true. For some people, the authority of the Bible is explicit or obvious on itself, uh, and divine authorship is just is. And I don't think I've said anything here, I certainly haven't intended to, to weaken or question that set of beliefs, if that's, those are your beliefs. That's fine. However, modern Bible scholars don't work on those assumptions, at least most don't. Today, the Bible is made ideas. So last time we spoke about the Bible as an anthology, right? The collection of various books, different genres, written over a long period of time, at least several hundred years. Uh, and yet, what I'm doing today is talk about the unity of the Bible, right? Even though the Bible is a diverse document, uh, a complex, uh, multi-tiered, <coughs> multi-level document, nonetheless, we could say the Bible says something. Or for dramatic purpose, I could say, the Bible teaches us that. What does the Bible teach us? Again, whether you want to learn it or not is not my business. I'm simply saying this is what the Bible says. What are the main points of the Bible? Here we are. Theological truth claims. God is the universal God who created the entire world and established a moral order. This, I would say, is perhaps the basic theme of the entire Hebrew Scriptures. Now, we already are very deep waters already, because we have a whole bunch of complicated things to, uh, to uh, disentangle here. So, God. God is sometimes goes by different names in the Hebrew Bible. Right? And this point is made much of by the authors of the documentary Hypothesis about which you no doubt have read in your reading for today. <laughs> yes. Uh, or you will. So the documentary hypothesis, which says that the Torah was put together out of pre-existing documents, right? So one of the uh, hallmarks, uh, one of the beginning points of that scholarship was the observation that God goes by different names in the Torah. Sometimes God is called YHWH, those are the four Hebrew letters, Yud, He, Vav, He, whose exact pronunciation we don't know. The only thing we know for sure is that Jehovah is the wrong pronunciation of those four letters, but the correct pronunciation is actually somewhat debated, and I, as a traditionalist Jew, don't want to pronounce the name of God because, well, we Jews just don't do that. And besides, we don't know what it is. So... Uh, one name of God is YHWH, usually translated Lord. Another common name for God is Elohim, usually translated God. The word, the name YHWH, the four-letter name of God, is, as we will discuss in the coming weeks, is found only in Israelite materials. Seems to be a quintessentially Israelite name of God. Whereas the other name, Elohim, is a grammatical variation on a name of God found all over the place in the ancient Near East. So Elohim might be translated not so much God, but perhaps the deity. Let's make it clear this is just some idea which is everywhere in the Near East, whereas YHWH is something uniquely Israelite. Is that significant? I'm sure it's significant. 
I'm not sure what its significance is, but this distinction surely is significant. God creates the world. So there are two poles in the Hebrew Bible in which we talk about divine authority. One pole is God the Creator. That's where the Bible begins, Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, well, that's the old translation. We'll come back to that translation problem. Right, when God began to create the world, that's how we begin in chapter 1, verse 1 of Genesis. And the Bible will regularly appeal to the creative act of God as the legitimation of divine authority. God has the right to tell you what to do because God created the world. He is the boss. He's the landlord. And you are simply tenants. This is an idea you find throughout the Hebrew Bible, especially in certain civic junctures or, mo or moments. So the divine authority is based in large part on God as the God of nature, we might say. God did not just create the world. Part of creating the world is that God also establishes a moral order by which the world is supposed to work. There is good and there is evil. There is right and there is wrong. And human beings have a moral responsibility to act appropriately. And if they don't, then God, the creator God, who set up the whole world and set up, set up the patterns for life, that God will punish you just as that God will reward you if you follow, what, if you do what you're supposed to do, if you do what you're told. <coughs> That's one pole, God the creator God. The other pole is God, we might say, the God of history. Right? God is involved in human events. God supervises human events. God is in charge of human events. Right? God has a stake in how humans behave. So again, if they behave properly, God rewards them. If they behave foolishly, wickedly, God punishes them. And out of all the historical acts of God, the one that occupies the most space in the Hebrew Bible is the exodus from Egypt. The Israelites are enslaved in Egypt. We'll read the story in a couple weeks. The Israelites are enslaved in Egypt, and God, via his chosen emissary Moses, God redeems them by a display of power. That act of divine intervention in human history is appealed to several times throughout Scripture as a way of showing that God can do anything. Specifically, when it comes to rewarding the righteous and punishing the wicked, we can trust God, because God will do it, God has done it, and God will do it again. These are the two poles, the Creator God, the God the God of nature, the God of history, who goes by different names, Y-H-W-H, or Elohim, or El, but it's all one God. Okay, there is no other God. Now things start to get a little more complicated. right? There is no other God. If you open Genesis chapter 1, which you will do shortly, as in next week, and start reading, right? You see that when in the beginning God, Elohim, created the love of love, okay, then God said this, God said that, God did this, God did that. You turn to chapter 2, you change the name from Elohim to YHWH. So God created, God fashioned, God did this, God did that, uh, Adam and Eve, Garden of Eden, blah, blah, blah. Okay, uh, I, I don't see any other gods anywhere. Do you see any other gods anywhere? There are no other gods anywhere, it's just Adam, Eve, and uh, God. Then the story keeps going of Cain and Abel, and then we have you know, some more stories and genealogy, blah, blah, blah. Then we come to Noah and the Flood, where God talks about how evil mankind is, and he's going to wipe them out in order to start over again. First time around didn't turn out so well, so God's going to start <coughs> over again via the Flood. Destroy all the, all the creation in order to begin again. Very interesting. Uh, are there any other gods anywhere in sight? The answer is no. Even the wicked generation of the flood, we are told, does not say anything about worshiping other gods. They're wicked, full of violence. Hamas is the word used in Hebrew. They're full of violence. They are acting wrongly. And God has every right to punish them. Okay, fine. I'm interested in this problem about gods. Are there any other gods anywhere in sight? The answer is no. 
fact, the Hebrew Bible assumes throughout, I'll take that back, the Hebrew Bible asserts throughout that there is one God from the very beginning. One God created heaven and earth, one God who established the moral order in the world, one God who keeps his eye on the humanity in general, and the Israelites in particular, one God who rewards the righteous and punishes the wicked. That's all one God from day one. So these truth claims, as I've described them in the Bible, are accepted by both Jews and Christians alike. This is that God, the God of the Bible, what Christians call the Old Testament, that's the God whom we, we Jews, we Christians, <coughs> whom we worship. But Jews and Christians have a lot to argue about, don't worry, right? I'm not suggesting they're the same. I'm simply commenting that as far as this set of truths which come out of the Hebrew Scriptures, this set of truths is shared by Jews and Christians alike. There's a question about what we might call monism versus dualism. Uh, at the end of the day, Christians wind up, the Jewish belief that in addition to God, there are other forces out there, some of which are hostile, some of which are contrary, some of which aim to thwart the divine will, whose sole pleasure and purpose is to seduce humans to, from the path, the true and straight path, to the path of error and sin, right? Uh, for Christians, this will loom very large in their understanding of the construction of the cosmos. Whereas in Jewish thought, this had its moment and then is eclipsed. Later on, Jews retreat to some extent, not completely, but to some extent from. So for Jews, for Jews, there is, I would call Jews, Judaism a monism, and Christianity I would call dualism. But you have to allow for all kinds of variations in these very large and complex systems of thought. It all depends what you're looking at and whom and so on. Uh, that's part of an answer to what you're saying. I want to talk about autonomy. That's a complicated problem for both Jews and Christians alike. How do you have human autonomy and an all-powerful God? I'm not the first person to notice that these are not entirely compatible one with another. And yet they are somehow both simultaneously true. Right, humans have autonomy, but yet God is all-powerful. Jews and Christians share that paradox. Okay, uh, ready to move along? Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Genesis 1, verse 26. What are we going to do with, and God said, let us make Adam in our image. Our, let us make Adam in our image. Ugh. Isn't that a plurality of gods? Well, uh, yeah, the answer is yes, it's God speaking plurally. Uh, does that mean that there are many gods? Or does that mean that God got help? Or does that mean that God has assistance? assistance? Uh, well, this is a cryptic point. There's no denying it. It's cryptic. Jews and Christians will argue about this. What it really means is probably, in context, it probably means God, who is who is imagined as a king, right? The king, as we all know, never sits all by himself in the throne room. That's not the way kings behave. Kings always sit surrounded by attendants and officers and soldiers and ministers and dignitaries of all kinds. That's the way kings are. So God, too, is imagined as having a court. So God is speaking, when it comes to the climax of the creation, the creation of Adam, which means humanity, uh, the climax of creation, then here God is working with his court. That's probably what it means. And then later Jews ran with that in one way, and Christians ran with that in a very different way. And that's all I'm going to say right now. But you're right, you put your finger on a, um, an interesting verse. We'll come back to that. Chapter 1, verse 26. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Okay, so the official party line, the official message of the Hebrew Bible is, there is one God in the language of Deuteronomy, there is none else. Ain od milvado. There is no other. Period. However, if one reads the Hebrew Bible carefully, as no doubt you will in the coming weeks, or even not so carefully, just read straight along, it's pretty obvious that the uh, Hebrew Bible itself is aware that out there the situation is very complicated. This idea that we Israelites 
worship the one true God and there is none else, the Bible itself gives us lots of information to show. The Bible itself is aware that this view is not without critics. This view is not without dissidents. So let's go talk about that. So I'm going to talk about these two points. There is no other God, I'm going to give it that, and then I'll talk about uh, the reward and punishment, I'll come back to that. So, there is no other God. The Bible is full of stories of idolatry. What is idolatry? Idolatry in the Hebrew Scripture is, uh, it, it, there is no word, by the way, in the Hebrew Bible for idolatry. Uh, it's a nice uh, Greek-English word, but the Bible nowhere conceptualizes this mysterious thing called idolatry. But the Bible instead gives us lots of stories and some polemics in which we see the Bible recognizes certain kinds of behavior as wrong. And we lump these behaviors together under our title of idolatry. One kind of behavior is called idolatry is to worship another god. An Israelite may not worship any god other than the one true god. And if an Israelite worships a god other than the one true God, that's bad. That's a sin. Said Israelite is liable to punishment from the one true God. That can be called idolatry. And if you ask, how about Ammonites or Moabites or Jebusites or Arameans or Philistines, is it okay for them to worship other gods? At this point, the Bible is notoriously vague. The Bible is not so much interested whom the Ammonites worship. Right? They can worship Milcom, and they can worship Kamosh, and they can worship Baal, or they can worship whoever they want to worship. It's not my problem. The Bible is making it interested that the Israelites shouldn't worship. So foreign worship, that's something we call idolatry. The other thing the Bible calls idolatry is the worship of images. Images. Israelites are not allowed to make an image of anything in the heavens or the earth or below the earth. That's paraphrasing here the Ten Commandments. Even if the Israelites who make the image are intending to represent the one true God, even if that's their intent, it is still forbidden. And certainly all the more so if they're making an image of some other god, in which case they're now compounding two errors. One is the prohibition of imagery, the other is the prohibition of worship of another god. This is the official storyline in the Hebrew Bible. Right? This is forbidden, don't do it, and Israelites who did it have thereby sinned and will bring down upon themselves the justifiable, condign wrath of God. Zap. Right? That's the storyline in the Hebrew Scriptures, right? Uh, look at the grand narrative of the Hebrew Bible. The Bible begins in Genesis chapter 1 with the one true God creates heaven and earth, creates everything, creates human beings, gets the ball rolling, human society, civilization take off, God destroys them again because he doesn't like the way things turn out, and then he tries again with Noah and the flood, still doesn't turn out so well. So he picks a specific clan, family to focus his attention on, right? And meanwhile, all we have is this one true God, there were no other gods anywhere. And then somewhere along the line, a key moment which the Bible nowhere discusses, somebody invented idolatry. Some sinful, thoroughly wicked, thoroughly rebellious, contumacious, obstreperous individual came up with the idea there's more than one true God. There are other gods. We should worship them. And the Israelites, any he, he, she, they seduced the Israelites. That's the imagery that's often used in the Bible. right? Sexual imagery. They seduced the Israelites to go a whoring to go astray after other gods. And the Israelites did so. And then they suffered punishment from God for their sins. This is the master narrative of the Hebrew Bible. Until finally, 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 at certain moments, some Israelites repent, and then God doesn't get so angry. He saves a few. He wipes these people out, but these people he keeps. Then in turn, they they fall, they low, uh, go, go sliding also, backsliding, so they have to punish them some more. Right, and this is the constant narrative. 
rebellion against God, followed by repentance and return, followed by rebellion, followed by repentance and return. And ultimately this explains why the Israelites are exiled from their land, why the Temple of Jerusalem is destroyed, and why the Israelites, a certain small number, finally are privileged to return to their land and to rebuild the Temple. And that's pretty much where the grand narrative of the Hebrew Bible stops. However, if you are a modern Bible scholar, and or if you are an attentive reader of Scripture, you realize that everything I just said is false. Or, should I press? That's too strong. Everything I just said is a highly prejudiced way of representing Israelite history. Because, in fact, it's backwards. So the, modern, the Bible would have you believe that the world begins with monotheism, if I may use that word, with the one belief and worship of the one true God, and then the world lapses into some idolatrous mode of worship, which is a rebellion against the one true God, whereas according to modern Bible scholars, we are convinced that this is simply completely backwards. that the world begins with the worship of many gods. There are national gods, each uh, nation has its own uh, chief god, gods, or god or gods. There are domestic gods. There are gods of nature. There are all kinds of gods. Gods with temples, gods without temples, gods with domestic shrines, all kinds of gods who are worshipped in all kinds of different ways by a wide variety of peoples. And the Israelites are no better, no worse, no different than anybody else. They, too, worship a wide variety of gods. Again, the national, domestic. A classic example of the domestic gods, I give, any archaeology student will tell you, one way you know an Israelite settlement, interesting archaeological question, when you're digging up you know, shards of the bottom layer of a house, what, what society are you looking at? Is it Israelite or is it not Israelite? Interesting question, right? So one way to know, there are all kinds of, archaeologists have come up with various ways of trying to distinguish between Israelite archaeological remains and non-Israelite archaeological remains. They don't say on it, Israelite, right? They don't have big Hebrew letters on it, so you don't know. So one way to know, there are various ways, one way to know is, if you find these things in, in, the, in the layer of the domestic architecture, you can be 99% sure it's Israelite, because these are found by the thousands these are small figurines. The top half seems to be that a figure of a woman from the waist up, with usually very prominent breasts, right? Uh, stylized woman, you can, see, you can see that. And whenever scholars see large breasts, we assume immediately it must be fertility, because what else are large breasts for? Right? So we have, these are must be fertility figurines, some kind of domestic piety. These are found in houses. Right, so what the Israelites did with these figurines, we don't know. But clearly, they are part and parcel of domestic Israelite culture. So much so, if you find these things, you can be pretty sure you're digging into an Israelite house. Now, class, what would you call these figurines? I know what I would call them. I would call them idolatry. But that doesn't make any sense, because Israelites who have these things don't think it's idolatry. They think that this is a perfectly reasonable way to behave, to encourage women to have healthy children, to encourage the uh, sheep to bear young, to encourage the process of nature and fertility upon which their lives depend. <coughs> That's not idolatry. I would call that religion. Culture. Civilization, one of those mysterious words you discussed in Anthropology 101. Right, one of those words. This is not idolatry. So for somebody to come along later and say that things like this is idolatrous, is somebody coming along later and trying to reinterpret, to reimagine Israelite history and culture from a very particular perspective. And to be very honest, ladies and gentlemen, a biased perspective, a prejudiced perspective a non-historical perspective. 
So, according to modern Bible scholars, we get a view such as this. Israelite religion does not begin with worship of the one true God. Israelite religion begins with the worship of various gods. And lurking behind these mysterious, varied names of God probably are different modes of worshiping God, perhaps different gods, uh, and gods get melded, blended, so uh, the various names of God probably once upon a time concealed different gods. So when do Israelites discover the one true God? Or if I can use the word monotheism, belief in the one God. According to the standard view, which has been endlessly debated, but I'll give you the standard view, and Chris Hayes talks about that in her uh, art article on your reading. Right, according to the standard view, sometime in the 8th century BCE, we have the rise of the God Alone Party, in the memorable words of my teacher, Morton Smith, in his wonderful book. There's a movement, a school, he called it a party. He didn't mean a party with beer, he meant a party, a, a group, of, uh, yeah, the movement. To say, the reason we Israelites are getting into trouble, the reason the Assyrians are beating us up, and the reason why we Israelites are in a great deal of distress is because we are not worshipping our God properly. Our God is a jealous God, and our God does not want you to worship other gods. Henceforth, we should worship the one true God, and that God, and that God alone. And the imagery that's used to understand this relationship is marriage. Just as a wife is obligated to have exclusive loyalty to her husband, Similarly, the people of Israel, now imagined as the wife, right, owe exclusive loyalty to their consort, who is God. Just as an adulterous wife gets kicked out, similarly, an adulterous Israel will lose divine protection. This is the imagery you find in the book of Hosea, this, uh, most famously, uh, from the 8th century BCE. Here we have a group of people, thinkers, philosophers, we might say, who are trying to reimagine Israelite religion and arguing the key point which we have screwed up until now, which henceforth we will get straight, is now we're going to worship the one true God, the one true God alone. Interesting question, Mr. Hosea, or Mr. Isaiah, Mr. Amos, uh, these prophets who apparently are the spokespersons of this new movement, if you trust modern Bible scholarship, it's new. How about other gods out there? There are other gods out there, aren't there? Oh yes, there are other gods out there. But we're not interested in them. They're not my problem. As long as you worship the one true God, the one true God alone, you are satisfying the divine mandate. Like the wife. There are other husbands out there, but there are no consequences to me. I am my husband. Pay attention to your husband. And don't worry about other husbands. This is sometimes called monolatry. Latry, L-A-T-R-Y, from the, like the same root as an idolatry. Same root. Latry means to worship. So the emphasis is worshiping on the one God. Not so much on the theological concept whether there are other gods, but focusing on the fact that Israel is, is liable to punishment if it worships any other God other than the one true God. However, as the centuries go by, we believe modern Bible scholarship, in the 6th century BCE, we have the, the intensification of this school, this God alone school, and now comes the forward the idea, at least, this is how, this is, again, all these points are debated, this is kind of the standard view, in the 6th century BCE, when the Israelites have been exiled to Babylon, the Babylonians have destroyed their temple, exiled them, and now in dribbles and drabs they are coming back, or dream of coming back, at this point, God's power, paradoxically, is not imagined as less than before, but divine power is imagined as even greater. You know those Babylonians who beat us up and destroyed the temple and exiled us? Well, they were working with God. They're on the God team. They just don't know it. Because there is only one God, period. And how about Baal and Nebo and Marduk? Ah, nothing, I tell you. Just smoke and mirrors, figments of the imagination, vapor. Pay them no heed, because they are things of naught. 
That's the 6th century BC, when all of a sudden we discover not just monolatry, but we discover what might, we might want to call monotheism, the idea that there is only one God and there is none else. This, this set of beliefs from the 6th century BC is then projected backwards onto Israelite history, is then projected backwards onto the narratives of Israel is then projected backwards onto the story of the creation of God, as if Adam and Eve knew only the one true God, as if all the figures of Genesis know only the one true God, because there, are, there, is, there is no one else. And the entire narrative of the books of Joshua, jo- Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, is rewritten from this perspective, showing the Israelites sin, they sin by rebelling against this one God, and then they are punished, and then when they are loyal to this God, they prosper. And the narrative is written from that perspective. And it is that perspective, which you might say, is the Bible's perspective. Even if, from our point of view, it is not historical. Do I call that truth or not? That's up to you. I'm not going to touch that. It is certainly not factually historical, even if it may be theologically true. All right, my time's just about up. I'm going to stop here. We'll continue this on Wednesday, and Wednesday also we'll look at some timelines and try to make these things clearer to you. Thank you.